The future of space flight, a text message detecting gun that could soon be in the hands of police departments, plus our picks for Hero or Zero of the Week. All these stories and more coming up on The Rundown. All right, stand by. Ten seconds. Ready to go. Greetings and thanks so much for joining us. This is The Rundown, where we take a look at some of the big stories making headlines. I'm your host, John Phillips. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is PJTV contributor Michelle Fields. And here in studio, we're joined by the columnist for The Washington Times. You can read her online at WashingtonTimes.com, Tammy Bruce. Now it's time to go to the top of The Rundown. And Tammy, you're up first. Well, there you go. All right. Well, uh, NASA just outsourced spaceflight to the private sector because it's more cost efficient and a smarter way to get things done, as we all know. This while, at the same time, they're effectively nationalizing health care. NASA's contract for Boeing uh, is worth uh, $4.2 billion. That's with a B. The contract for SpaceX is $2.6 billion. The companies will develop, test, and fly space taxis to take U.S. astronauts into orbit. Maybe we're going to have to regulate those taxis as well. These would replace the Russian systems that currently provide access to the International Space Station. The first taxi to the uh, station is set for 2017. And we thought, of course, the private sector was bad and stuff. Surely uh, they uh, didn't and can't build that now, can they? I mean, this is, it's pretty, I, find, I like this idea. I think it's fabulous that it's being privatized. Um, I, I think it's going to go well, clearly. It's going to get something done, unlike the federal government. But I do find it slightly ironic that we're doing this for the space uh, uh, flight dynamic, but then at the same time, we're nationalizing health care, John. Well, I think people like NASA. I think people like space exploration. People are fascinated with it. I mean, look how movies like Star Trek, Star Wars, how they do when they focus on the topic. Little kids love it. Um, when uh, they do the, um, uh, the field trips, the observatories, the kids just can't get enough. But I think people are frustrated with NASA at the same time. Think about this. In 1969, we went to the moon on 1960s technology. Mm -hmm. Everybody understood the next step was landing a man on Mars. That's been the goal for some time, and we still haven't done it. So I think people are kind of throwing up their arms and they're saying, what's going on over mm -hmm. at NASA if we haven't landed a man on Mars by now? Let's go ahead and opt for plan B, and that's the private sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Michelle, NASA, uh, when Obama first took over, said that their new mission was going to be making Muslims feel better about themselves. Obviously, that was patronizing and ridiculous. I'm not quite sure what this has. To, maybe they've decided this is not a good idea and relying on Russia is also not a good idea. Do you think that there's anything beneficial uh, to, to have stayed, let's say, with the government paying for everything? Or do you think that there's this is 100 percent fabulous for us to be privatizing this dynamic? Well, I think there's a little nostalgia for when it comes to NASA. People like to see the uh, American flag uh, put on on the moon, and hopefully they were hoping that NASA would one day go to Mars, like John said, and, and put an American flag there and a man there. Um, but the thing is, is exactly what John said, is that it seems as though NASA has is still getting a lot of money, but hasn't really done very much. So they want to go to plan B because they want to see things done. But there still is that nostalgia. You want your country and NASA to do it again. But if the private sector is doing it better, I don't see why not. Well, you know, this, but that's the question um, in closing here is that it's American companies that are doing it. It's not the government technically. But doesn't that make it possible that it could end up being international companies, that it takes it away from being, uh, or the potential of it being an American accomplishment? That's my one worry here. Well, I mean, yeah. let's make no mistake. Even if the government were to do it, they would contract out the building of a lot of this stuff to private companies. I mean, it would be, you know, in the old days, I guess, McDonnell Douglas made a lot of stuff for it. They'd go and to Boeing. Other, and sure. Boeing. They'd go to companies like that, which are almost, they're of the private sector, but they're quasi-government firms right, because exactly. the government's their biggest client, or at least in, in space it is. Um, so the private sector was al already doing a lot of the heavy yeah. lifting to begin with. SpaceX is the new dynamic here, and even Jeff Bezos now says he's going to start building rockets. So it's going to be an interesting few years, I think. All right. Michelle, what do you have for us? At the top of my rundown, move over speeding guns. A new device will allow cops to tell if you are texting. Comsonics is creating a device that picks up on radio frequencies that come from a cell phone being used inside of a car. The Virginia company says it's similar to devices that are used by cable technicians to detect leaks. 
The text detecting gun is close to production. It still needs legal approval before it can be used. 44 states now ban texting while driving. I think that this is going to be, if this, if this gets approved and states pick up on this, this is going to be the new way for them to get a lot of revenue. What you do know, you it's think? interesting because if you get involved in an accident, and you call 911, they'll say, we don't have time, we don't have manpower to respond to an accident unless someone's injured and then they send the EMTs. Um, home break-ins, the cops don't respond to those in certain cities. Detroit, there are portions of the city that the cops do not police because they say they don't have the manpower and they don't have the budget to do it. So if they don't have the budget and they don't have the manpower to respond to home break-ins, and to respond to accidents or respond to entire portions of a city, then how do they have the time and the manpower to do this? Why? Because it generates revenue. That's, that's right. why. That's it. Yes. You know, that's a, and Michelle, you hit it, John. You know, this is they'll put the money into something that will give them a profit. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. But the problem becomes if this is just the beginning, are we saying that you can interfere with the privacy of what's happening in an automobile? What's next? Are they going to shoot the the gun that gives them an x-ray view of what's happening inside the automobile, which is your private property, because they might not like what you've got in the passenger seat, or maybe your kid's not buckled up. Where do you stop once we allow people, uh, the police authorities, to look immediately in some way into the automobile? Well, and here's another question. Why is texting more dangerous than eating French fries? Yeah. Or changing the radio station? Or yelling at, or turning your back and yelling at the kid in the back seat because they're not being quiet. You know, this is, yeah. this is just preparing us, Michelle, I think, for something much larger. All right. Time to move to the top of my rundown, where comedian Bill Maher is taking his flip a district campaign straight to the district itself. The winner was Minnesota Republican John Klein. The announcement was made during Friday's broadcast. It was a live show. Let's go ahead and take a listen. The most useless person in Congress in our flip a district contest must not feel bad after all, there can only be one winner, but let me assure each and every one of you, in my book, you're all losers. <laughs> but be warned, we did not pick the biggest clown, because the real problem in Washington isn't the funniest fools, it's people like our winner tonight, the living embodiment of legislation for hire, mm -hmm. the men's warehouse of empty suits, <laughs> from Minnesota's 2nd District, come on down, Congressman John Klein! <laughs> The host wants to go to Client's District, and the show is figuring out all the details right now. And this is interesting. John and Ken did this locally That's to right. David Dreyer, longtime congressman, where they focused nonstop on defeating him. They actually did it to Joe Baca, too. Mm. They were unsuccessful in both cases, where they launched campaigns to get these guys kicked out because it was a throw-the-bums-out sort of mood, and uh, let's pick a Republican, let's pick a Democrat. didn't work. The fact of the matter is, is that while Bill Maher is successful, he's made millions and millions of dollars doing this show and shows before that politically incorrect, the number of people that watch that show is still relatively small in the grand scheme of things when you've got a country with 300 plus million people. When you look at how many people are watching that show in Klein's district, it's probably minuscule. My prediction is that Clyde wins re-election easily, and Bill Maher generates some publicity out of it, but he's not going to kick him out of office. I agree, and I think that it's, it's beyond publicity. I think it's also about a, a, a misunderstanding of your own level of influence because of his bubble. So in his bubble, everyone he knows watches him. But of course, in the bubble of the world, perhaps not many people are. So you've got this mistaken idea about what it is that you can accomplish. Uh, and, you know, he might be funny and might have certain opinions that make people on the left happy. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I don't think people take him seriously in that kind of a way. Should John Klein be worried, Michelle? <laughs> no, I don't think he is. I think you're right. He's going to generate some publicity. People are talking about it. But I think, you know, the people who watch Bill Maher are leftists who tend to live on the coast or live in the D.C. Beltway bubble. I don't think he has as much influence as he thinks he has. And I don't think that Klein should be concerned or worried at all. All right. Now it's time to move on to Zero or Hero. How 1990s Nintendo. I love those feel. graphics. All right, this is where we pick a person or group for doing something very good or very bad. Michelle, you're up first. 
All right, my hero is Peter Thiel this week for being so frank. The Silicon Valley venture capitalist is known for being sharp-tongued and outspoken. Take a listen to an interview he gave this week to CNBC in which he trashed Twitter, Uber, and Apple. Twitter's hard to evaluate. It's, uh, it, they, they have a lot of potential. It's a horribly mismanaged company. Um, the people, you know, probably a lot of pot smoking going on there, but... Uh, wow. But, um, <laughs> but it doesn't, what do you really think? But, uh, but it's uh, such, a, such a solid franchise right. that maybe it works even I with all that. I'd... I do think Uber is the uh, most ethically challenged company in Silicon Valley at this, at this point. Ethically challenged. I'm biased there because I'm, I'm an investor in, uh, in Lyft. Uh, I, I feel that Uber has a, has a, uh, I feel it has a negative ring because it, it, it sort of uh, means you're above everybody, right. above the law. <laughs> And, that and that's you'll daring get in some authority. Trouble. Whereas Lyft is uplifting. I'd probably still go with, with Google. The, 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 the risks with Apple are that at some point, um, the phone, they lose the pricing power on phones. The risk with Google is uh, the EU antitrust stuff. Those are the, those are the basic risks, but, but there's probably more, more upside with Google over the next decade. Um, every time you have an uh, innovative tech company that does something no one has done before, it will be in a unique place. It will have a product nobody else has. So when Apple built the first smartphone that worked, it for many years had a monopoly of sorts on the iPhone. And that, uh, that's a good monopoly. It's one that doesn't create scarcity, but creates new forms of, uh, of plenty. Well, FedEx is a, it's another, it's a good monopoly that replaced the bad monopoly that is the post office. Right. So, you know, if, if these things are too static, they, they, there's a point where they get to be bad. It's, it's in a static world where there's no innovation. Monopolies are always bad. I loved this interview because he's sitting there and he's saying exactly what he thinks. And I love that he went out there and said, yes, yeah, some monopolies are good as long as they're natural monopolies. You know, they corner the market with a great product. That's a good thing. Whereas a lot of Democrats are upset about this, saying, oh, my gosh, he's in favor of monopolies. I, I think it was great that he went there and he, he said exactly what he thinks. You know, I love billionaires because they're like old people. They just don't care. Yeah. They'll say whatever is on their mind, and they don't care what you think, and they don't care what you think, and they don't care what Michelle thinks. And he was honest about his investment in Lyft. Yeah. Uh, so you've got to give him that. And uh, look, you take it or leave it, but obviously he's been very successful the way he makes decisions. All right, Tammy, you're up. All right, well, my zero is Waffle House. I know that's shocking. The restaurant chain asked a uniformed Texas DPS trooper, a public safety trooper, to leave because he was armed. Management is now apologizing. That's always happens. Now they're apologizing for the incident. The trooper was in his field uniform, which included a badge on his belt. The manager didn't see this, they say, and only saw the weapon. He was asked to leave, and that created a firestorm on social media appropriately. Waffle House says its policy allows police officers to bring weapons into their restaurants. So it's a, a little bit of a hysterical dynamic going on at this point. Um, and it, it, I, we don't know how much longer this is going to go on, but really enough already with being afraid with people who are walking in because of their job or because they have a concealed carry with a firearm, really. You know, if you own a business that's open at 2 a.m. and a lot of them are right next to the freeway, don't you want law enforcement you, you in You want somebody with a firearm who knows how to use <laughs> yes. it is what you want. That's what you want. All right, my zero is a driver. One who woke up in a field of donkeys oh. after he went missing when his vehicle rolled over in Roswell, New Mexico. Me too. Oh. Man told 911 dispatchers he was lost and surrounded by donkeys. <laughs> he claims that he and a friend were drinking the night before, shocking I know, but didn't remember what happened next. <laughs> The driver was issued multiple citations, and there he is, Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, as uh, last reported, he was not probed. Yeah, and maybe it was just he showed up in a Democratic convention and mistake, mistook them all for something else. So hard to say. What do you think his drink was, Michelle? Um, uh, something strong and probably <laughs> a lot of them. Yeah, I think anything that pours is his drink. All right, that's going to do it for today's show. What do you think about our picks for Hero Zero of the Week? We want to know what you think, so be sure to leave your comments in the comments section below. I'm John Phillips for Tammy Bruce joining me here in Los Angeles and Michelle Fields in the nation's capital. Thanks so much for watching The Rundown.